All right. We have some Turkish people here. My God. <laughs> All right. It's going to be in Turkish then. No. So what did you think? Yeah? Did that warm up your right brain? That's what it's supposed to do. Makes your uh, creative brain kind of wake up. But could you show it to, uh, to, well, to me and to each other? Beautiful. Just hold it up. Beautiful, nice. <laughs> I love it. It so messy. Beautiful. Wow. That is kind of great. Good job. Yeah. You guys are great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> okay, so if you feel like it, you can sign it and give it to each other. If you want to hold on to it, you can hold on to it. They put that. Kind of over there. Ah, okay. That's what I, I wasn't sure if you I were going to do. I didn't start yet. I didn't start. Oh, good. Yet. Okay. Stand here. More or less. Very. <laughs> All right. So cool. Now you have a masterpiece to take home. This uh, this actually is a magical exercise, and I often. Um, start with, with it because um, when I first came to the States from Turkey, the first exercise at Pratt, I was a graduate student like you, um, first class, first hour, the first thing we did was this exercise and our professor asked us to turn to each other and draw our neighbor and I drew Rodolfo Sanchez who is from Argentina and he drew me, Aisha Birsel from Turkey and Ever since that, then we're best of friends, even though he lives in Argentina and I live here. So you are now going to be, it's sealed, you're going to be best of friends with the person that you drew. <laughs> That's the magic of the exercise. Okay, um, I'm so, so happy to be here. When um, Stephen Heller asked me to come, that was, I think, like three months ago. And, and I've been waiting for this day ever since. So I feel very lucky to be with you. Um, thank you for inviting me. And this is it. This is how you draw um, a face. <laughs> but you didn't need this. But often I do also classes with non-designers and ask them to do this exercise. And it terrorizes them because usually um, the last time uh, people drew anything is when they were in like kindergarten. And so they're like, ah, and it um, breaks the ice. So what I wanted to talk to you today is about this, um, how do you bring together opposing needs and wants? Because to me, that's what design is. It's about... Ron wants to blind me. Okay, well. <laughs> so, you know, often what you want and what you need are opposing. And if you can harmonize those things, you can create incredible value. Um, does anything come to your mind when I say op opposing wants and needs? There you go. Exactly. Or I thought you were going to say you need to adhere to some constraints. Yeah. And any, any, anybody else? I'll tell you, one of my favorites is um, 
and I think you will join me in this, but um, I want to go on vacation, but I need to make a living. Right? Often. So if you can make a living or earn ma money while you're on vacation, that would be a way to harmonize the, these two things. So my little trick is I work on vacation, and usually I do my best work. I just do a little bit. But that's when I do my best thinking. And so, actually, I feel like I should always be on vacation. <laughs> but it's, um, it's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it, do you know this book, um, Four Hour Week, Tim Harris? Um, you might want to check it out. It's full of tricks about how to do things like in four hours and then have the rest of the day to yourself. So I'm a product designer, and today what I'll do is I'll share some of my products and projects with you. We'll go through them together. And the way I try to think is I try to break what I know, reality, and then think about those things differently. And then I try to solve uh, and create new reality that brings new value. So often we're conditioned by things we know. Actually, you know, ever since childhood, we're conditioned to find and learn patterns. And you know, when you see this and this together, you're like, oh, well, that means that. That it's safe, or it's comfortable, or this, or that. Um, and as a designer, you need to rethink all those things, right? So you, what we constantly try to do is actually move away from what we know, and I call that breaking um, reality, and then breaking our preconceptions. And then just that allows us to think about the same things differently from a different perspective. Um, and then hopefully from that get to a, a new solution that brings more value in where you can literally say one plus one equals three. There's, the sum is more than the, um, the parts. And, oops, I guess that wasn't what I was supposed to do. Go back. Don't go back. Ah, so one example I wanted to give and start with is toilet seat. So if you break apart just those two words, it's toilet and? Um, so that is a very simple deconstruction, right? But that allowed me to understand and realize that actually toilet seats are seats. And like a chair, they should be designed to be very comfortable. And that led me to a new um, toilet design where the seat is very generous in terms of its size and formed like a, a chair. So you can see these are the um, early concept sketches where the understanding is that this um, seat is going to be larger than um, what we know as a toilet seat. And that the back is going to go up to support the sm small of your back and the front is going to scoop down so that when you're sitting it doesn't bite into your legs. It literally is like that, um, the caper chair that you're all sitting on, except that it has a hole in it. Okay, um, and th these were some of the, um, I was thinking what to do with the accessories, so that was an accessory bar that was part of the design. Um, this was the first prototype. Um, there's something wrong with this prototype. You want to tell me what it is? It's not big enough. <laughs> is it that the top doesn't go down over the seat? Um, actually, it did. It kind of went like that. Something else? Have you ever seen a green toilet seat? All right, that, that's the, what's wrong with it. You don't do anything in the bathroom that's not white. So that was my first lesson. We, um, it is, this actually was very big. It was like flowing. And, um, and then this is the end result where it became white, the um, curves got tighter, and the, um, 
the cover is smaller than the um, seat itself um, because if you make the cover as big as the um, so toilet seat, it, it's wasteful. All you're trying to do is cover this hole, basically. And then it has this little hole so that you can put your finger in there and lift it up. But also it's a visual trick because if you don't have this hole, it becomes all plastic. But that hole kind of breaks that, that mass. And um, as you can see, it's, um, it's also a bidet so that um, you can wash your bum with it. And that's the idea. But the other idea is, have you ever cleaned your toilet? I hope you did. <laughs> it's probably the worst um, you know, chore in the house, right? Um, so this toilet seat, you can, um, well, I knew about that because I was um, fascinated by um, washing toilets when I was a kid. Like when I was five years old, I would clean the toilet and then expect a tip from that. Um, but that kind of memory carried, you know, I carried with me and I had thought, what if you can just snap off the lid in the seat and wash them under the faucet? Wouldn't that be easier? So this idea of um, uh, snap on, snap off seat came from that. And then this little guy, this is the little Nintendo like controls for the, um, the water, for the bidet function. So you have more or less water and then the, um, the little sea line plays with more balls or less balls depending on the water pressure. And what's funny about this, it, it's wireless, right? So when um, this toilet seat um, wash that it's called started selling in the States, um, you could, somebody could be in the bathroom and you could be on the outside and turn on the water. <laughs> and <laughs> kids figure that out pretty quickly. And <laughs> so that, that's the toilet seat. And this is the reason I started with it is it's because to this day it's one of my favorite projects. And not everybody gets the honor of designing a toilet, and I did. And, um, and then I was known as a toilet queen for a while after I did that. Um, so I'll just continue to show you things. Um, this is a project we had done for Avino for Johnson & Johnson. And they wanted to start their first organic line for um, babies and kids. And so these are some of the um, sketches, just to give you a sense of, of sometimes we present ideas like this. Um, we love sketching, so it, there are always some sketches and then um, some 3D renderings. Let's see. And then at one point, I don't know if you know the Avino brand, but it's all made up of oats, um, and they they had a whole plan about harvesting organic oats, um, using, um, you know, working with farms that had predominantly women um, working. It was a, really a beautiful story. And we thought, well, how can we reflect that there are good materials like oats that go into this um, organic formula? And so at one point, we had this idea of doing the bottle like an oat, the shape of an oat and texturing the bottle like that as well. And then they asked us to do um, some graphics and some illustrations for it, which was kind of unusual. So I did some drawings for it. And then this is the, um, oops, sorry, Avino. I right. just want to make sure that's not from my kids. You know. Mom. <laughs> so um, these, this is the, um, the product, and as you can see, the oat shape and the, um, the texture of the oats went into the final product. Unfortunately, my illustrations didn't, didn't make it. Um, I think they felt it was too cute, which is the idea, right, when you're doing um, products for kids. But, um, and then uh, this was on the shelves for like six months and then FDA pulled it back and said, um, it's not truly organic. So now um, it's in limbo. Like, oh, this is um, our projects in West Africa. 
My husband and partner is from uh, Senegal. He's um, French Senegalese. And so we'd go to Senegal and um, while we're on vacation, as I said, I like to work on vacation, we would go visit um, local craftspeople and people who like making things and then collaborate with them and we would try things out. And so you see the streets kind of look like this, very vibrant colors and um, just not a lot of tall buildings, quite beautiful. And then um, these are people that we would work with. And then we would like literally draw on the material itself full scale. And then they would cut it out. And then they would um, weld it together. And, and there is something so satisfying about that after uh, working on 3D models for lo so long, where um, kind of this real materials and real time doing things. Um, and then sometimes what I loved is the craftspeople, the people we'd work with, would say, you know, actually it should be like this. And they would take the pencil or the chalk and then that's exactly what's going on there. You know, he's telling me that we should change this curve. And so we made rocking chairs like that. And then we made jewelry, which this one is um, one of those working with um, Moroccan um, jewelers and using some of their techniques to make pipes, to make um, spoons, where you layer materials and then you just um, lay them. So these are um, silver and ebony, but there's also plastic and copper. And then th th these experiments never really led anywhere. We just played, basically, except Eventually, we got connected with Moroso in Italy. Do you know the um, Italian comp company Moroso? Oh, check it out. It's Moroso, M-O-R-O-S-O. They're really at the leading edge of um, Italian design, and they're, um, the leader of the company is a woman, Patricia Moroso, and she's fearless, and she's always done what she believes in, um, so they, they really are unique in, in what they do. Um, and so a couple years back, she asked us, she invited us to collaborate with them um, around a, a project that she called Mafrik. Mafrik is the uh, shortening of Ma, Afrik, my Africa. And so, and her goal was, you know, all we hear about Africa in the news is famine and war and strife. And why can't we show that beautiful and great things also come out of Africa? So this project, uh, Mafrik, was about bringing designers like us together with craftspeople and creating beautiful pieces knowing, using their know-how. Uh, so this is Madame Dakar. It's a, an armchair. Well, I, I guess it's not an armchair. It doesn't have arms. It's a lounge chair for one person. And it's really large in scale, and it's inspired by the beautiful and really tall and really wide women of Dakar that we, I would see on the streets that look like beautiful walking sculpture. And so this is uh, an, an homage to them. And it uses their weaving technique using um, thread from um, fishing nets. Isn't that beautiful? And, um, and this is the idea of using, you know, a lot of these things are based on bending um, metal and then creating a shape and then weaving it. Um, and so this was using the, um, the tube almost like a line in space in one movement and then creating a one-armed um, stool. And here are the, again the um, craftspeople it's a lot of um, you know, handwork and sweat. And then here is the um, producer, who, uh, Salam, who really made sure that the pieces, even though they're handmade, would always come out more or less the same, which was really important. Um, because we found out that in um, Senegal, craftspeople are, you know, because it's made by hand, whether something is like a cent centimeter, or so two centimeters, or three centimeters, sometimes four centimeters off, is not that important to them. But to us, it's key, you know? So uh, Salam was really um, 
helpful there to maintain the quality. And then this is actually um, Bibi, my partner, working together with um, uh, the welder to make this piece that's um, not great functionally. It's not very comfortable, but it was more of a sculpted piece. And here they are drawing it together full scale to, um, to make that. <laughs> and then he's modeling it. I really like that. These are rocking chairs. They're um, welded metal pieces. And the back has a slot. And you jam a wood back into it. And it's really comfortable. And then you can rock. Um, and then these um, drawings are inspired by uh, the drawings on um, trucks and vans and minivans. And they're all like talismans in their protective drawings. And so we use those. This is the um, Madame Dakar finish. And this is the team. So Patricia Moroso is here. And then this is the rest of the team. Of course, this is me and this is Bibi. And, uh, and some of the other designers and, and artists that were part of the Mafrique. All right, and then um, one more thing out of Africa are these um, recycled stools. What's interesting is there's really a garbage problem in, um, in Africa. Uh, you, in their, you, um, cities don't know, don't know what to do with all the waste. And so this is a very kind of small intervention in that big um, problem. But it's, um, there are women who um, gather garbage and break it down, um, which makes for these um, little plastic pellets. And um, Bibi, actually, my partner, uses them to make these tools that are, um, let's see, 80% um, garbage, basically, and 20% um, pure plastic. So the 20% is what holds the shape together. And then the, uh, the rest of it is made up of these um, pellets. And what's interesting in Africa is that there is not much industry. So a lot of what happens is really by hand, um, except here we were able to find a factory that um, made uh, mass manufactured, like Industrial design is mass manufactured, right? They make mass manufactured um, water tanks and cisterns. Um, and so we were able to use the same technology, which is a roto molding technology. You make a mold, you put the um, plastic inside it, and you roll it. And as you roll it, you bake it. And then out comes these um, stools, and then the, the table in the middle. And this is the prototype, and this is the um, the lunch, uh, I guess the cafeteria now of, at the factory. Oh, and then these, <laughs> this, this, these are the prototypes. And these are our kids, Awa and Alev, and their cousins in the, um, in the garden, testing it out. Very cool. Like <laughs> um, and then we had the um, fortune to have MoMA PS1 asked us um, for these tools for the PS1 Cafe. So if you go to PS1 Cafe, or you might have already gone there, um, these are the stools, and that's the story. Um, there are about 50 of those stools in there and, and the tables. All right. So far, so good? Am I talking a lot? I am, I know, but it's like <laughs> We have more time. OK, so now I want to tell you, that was kind of like the non-industrious, but really like a lot of heart projects. Now there's a lot of heart, but it's, here's an industrial design project. And it's based on how to welcome people in offices. So, and it's based on the idea, the geometry of 120 degrees. Um, the two things come together in the sense that if you want to, like you haven't seen somebody in a long time and you open your arms, just open your arms. You want to hug somebody. Yeah. You know what that angle is? That's 120 degrees. OK? Now keep that in mind, and we'll come back to it. So this was for Herman Miller, and it, it was about creating office systems. And really, what's interesting about office systems is that the user doesn't get to choose where they sit. 
I'm sorry to break it to you, but if you go work in somebody else's office, you will have very little control over the furniture and your environment. Um, and that's the reality of offices, that somebody, like the architect or the facility manager, chooses the furniture for you. And so when you, like me, design um, office systems, it's really important that whatever we do, that it's kind of foolproof that in any condition that it creates and provides a decent work environment for somebody. So this idea of welcoming the user is really important because the user doesn't have choice. Um, so these are kinds of the things that you need to take care of when you design an office. There needs to be some kind of display of work and now these days it's um, ele mostly electronic display. There needs to be some sense of enclosure, uh, less and less so. Um, there needs to be some delivery of um, power and data uh, connection, uh, a sense of community because we're working with other people, um, some natural and artificial light, some sense of your territory, like this is my space even if it's for one hour, and then a work surface where you can put stuff. And so here we come back to the 120 degrees. What's interesting about 120 degrees is not only is it kind of the span of your arms when you want to hug someone, but it also happens to be the most economical angle that, with which you can create structure. That's why nature grows in 120 degrees. Trees grow in 120 degrees, bubbles, um, honeycombs. And then, of course, I'm Turkish, right? So all, almost all of the Islamic um, patterns use 120 degrees as well. So these things came together um, to create. Well, not yet. OK, <laughs> slowly it will create something. But these are the early sketches of like what an office is, mock-ups of, okay, if we have a, a, a flat screen, maybe if it's on a moving arm, and then maybe there is a light that's a diffuse light on an arm, and then my keyboard on an arm, and maybe using these three things, I can define my, my space, right? Um, so this was kind of the beginning. And then it moved on to this idea of what if we create 120 degree corners? And so this open arm thing, right? It also creates the span of your work surface. And then um, we started transforming our office into a mock-up of this office, of, of this system. And we cut out some 120 degree work surfaces. We bought some blankets from IKEA and then we sewed on um, pockets on them, and then we left some of it transparent. And then we started working in them. And when we had our first kind of like design presentation, we invited the client and we opened the door and the client walked into the first installation of, um, of this idea. And then it became kind of a lab. We would try different things, hang stuff, bring in new materials, and then as the idea progressed and we knew more and more what we were trying to do, um, we started creating more mock-ups uh, in larger spaces to see how a whole floor plate of these would look like. And these are just PVC pipes and paper and foam core. So it helped us get a sense of um, the application. And so now as we approach the final product, What's interesting about the, the Resolve office system, which was for Herman Miller, um, is that there are only about 20 parts to it compared to other systems that have like hundreds of pieces, um, but with which you can make many different things. So it has these poles for vertical structure, arms uh, for horizontal support, and then those MDF cut pieces that you saw in the earlier um, images became the work surfaces. And then we also created these soft elements to give you a sense of space. So a roof over your head and a rolling screen behind your back. So the idea of how can we give people a sense that they, they're enclosed in a space without literally being enclosed and not, um, you know, so that they, they're not sitting in a cubicle, but 
they have a sense of um, their own space. So this is the end result. And as you can see, it's this combination of hard, structural, very sturdy elements and very soft um, kind of fabric elements that you can print on. And these are the pieces that you can change very easily. And these are very long-term pieces. So there's this kind of short-term, long-term aspect to it. And um, these bumpy ones are ones that you can Velcro on, but they're also translucent, um, which was really important. How do you let light through um, without, uh, uh, but still giving people a sense of their space? And just to, to give you an idea of how it looks in space, this is in a um, library. And then this is at eBay. I love this picture because you, know, you make all these things, right? To, like, to create a beautiful system. And then the user can still kind of do whatever they want with it. And so they took off the, all the um, screens and they only kept the um, steel infrastructure. And they have direct connection to each other. And then they, they hung all sorts of things off of it. Oh, really? Yeah, where I went to school, where we went to college, this is what our studio space was. So how was it? I loved them. Really? They're Thank you. Wow, that, yeah. <laughs> I love hearing that. Cool. OK. So one more system like that. I love systems, you know, things that are made up of pieces that come together, like Lego systems. Um, so this is about now a storage system. And it starts with the idea that today, People store anything and everything in offices. Um, maybe you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, all people stored were like pieces of paper, right? And folders and files. But today, people come with their laptops and their gym clothes and their lunch. And so how do you store all these very eclectic things and functions and forms? So what we did is we deconstructed and reconstructed storage. And this deconstruction, reconstruction is really the process that we use. And what we realized is storage, when you deconstruct it and really ask, well, what does this do? It, it does a couple things. You know, it organizes your stuff, it contains it, it covers it, and you can lock it, it secures it. But to me, what was really interesting is that it holds your things upright. If it wasn't for storage, our stuff would be on the floor in piles, which for me it still sometimes is, like piles of books and piles of folders and you know, stuff. But really, the, um, so holding upright is the center of storage. And so that kind of is like, um, almost like the body. And how do we hold up the body is, there's like a skeleton, that's the structure. And then you have organs that the structure holds, right? Um, and that's kind of like the utilities of storage. You have shelves, drawers, and um, doors, and different things that the structure holds. And then you have skin, right, that covers it all up. And that's kind of like the cladding, um, different materials to cover it with. So here's where that goes. Um, this is a storage system. It's called Teneo, and it has, again, very few parts. It has these aluminum rings that comes in different heights, and then you can space them at different widths, and between them you can hang um, different things. When you combine these, you can, with 20 pieces, you can make 80 products. And that's what's so cool about this idea is, like, again, how can you do more with less? Um, you can have shelves, drawer and shelves. You can have doors and um, file drawers. You can have bookshelves. You can have different things. And it could be like the same piece, right? Can be mixed and matched in different ways. This is the least expensive version, and it's a bookshelf. And this is the most expensive version because it uses 
most materials. And in between, you could have a combination of bookshelves um, and file drawers and drawers. You could have uh, magazine displays. Um, you can have, is that the same thing? No. <laughs> uh, different sizes. And then completely enclosed. But the other thing I really like is you can clad it with different materials. So you can clad it with steel, laser cut steel, uh, veneer, cork, and felt. Yay, I remembered all my materials. <laughs> and then you can do these things. So um, depending on what you clad it with, it can look very different. Um, this you can imagine in a very upscale law office. You can imagine this in my home. You can imagine this in a, a very young um, studio. Uh, you can imagine that somewhere else. So they take on, with the different claddings, it takes on a different char character. It also is a different price point. All right. <clears throat> if I wanted to drink water, is there like a water fountain? Could we take a minute break? Is there a fountain nearby? Really? Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, -na -na -na. did you read the whole thing? What, where is this going to go now? This is a perfume project, and it was a conceptual project um, done with MoMA and the um, New School, and it was about um, the future of the scent and perfume industry and developing new concepts for them. And so I was one of the um, designers that they invited and it was called, um, what, what did they call us? They called us um, accidental perfumers. Kind of like, I don't know what that really meant, whether we were uh, going to create accidents or we were accidentally perfumers. But so, What's interesting about perfume, do you put on any perfume or like eau de cologne or something like that? Do you realize that like when you put it on, you, you can smell it, right? And then it, two seconds later, you can't smell it anymore. And then, but then if you hug someone, they'll smell it and they'll say, hopefully, uh, you smell good. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's the um, nature of perfumes that, or scents in general, like our, um, uh, kind of nose, can smell something, but then it's like a threshold. You walk through it, and then it goes away. It's, it's done. You can't prolong it. So that idea of the, realizing that scent is like a threshold, it's like, you know, a threshold is a door thing, right? You're either on the outside, you're in it, or you're past it. And that's kind of the scent idea. Um, we combine that, well, first, I thought, okay, what if we create literal thresholds? Like, um, who's the designer who did the gates in um, Central Park? Christo. Kind of like Christo's gates. Do you remember that project in um, Central Park? Oh, you have to look at, you, if you don't know, do you have to look it up? Christo's Central Park gates, okay? He covered all of Central Park, this was about 10 years ago with gates, with arches that had these orange flags and you would walk through them. Uh, it's really magical. And my head was there when I started this and I thought, what if I create these uh, thresholds, like these doors of perfume and that you walk through them and quickly realize that we didn't have budget for it, we didn't have the manpower, the time to do it. So then you're like constraints, right? You're like, Meh. okay, uh, we can't do that. So these were some of the um, little sketches we made. This literally is like um, Christo's Gates. And this is, thank you so much. Oh, very kind. So sorry, but thank you. All right. This is kind of like a fabric that is imbued with um, with um, perfume or scent and you would walk through it. Okay, those are unrealistic ideas. I should get those out of your head. Now, let's move on to, so then we said, okay, what if we work in, if the idea is thresholds, life also has thresholds. 
So we cross-fertilized the idea of thresholds and life, and we thought, what if we create thresholds of life and perfumes and forms for it? So because we were trying to work within the constraints, we thought, well, we can do something that's as small as your hand, that's manageable. So that became this pebble. And then we told the, uh, the perfumers we were working with, listen, we want to do thresholds in life. And it starts with birth, and it ends in death. And it kind of goes like birth, baby, puberty, sex, partnership, empty nest, and death. Those were the seven that we kind of wanted to work with. And then we, we wrote descriptions for, for the perfumers. These are perfumers from um, IFF, which is the world's second larger um, maker and creator of scents and perfumes and aromas. And we, tell, we told them, look, birth, um, we think it kind of should smell like cold, a little bit bloody and uh, foreign. Um, uh, death should smell like rotting in kind of cold and like wet earth. And um, let's see, uh, puberty should probably have multiple scents in it that are fighting each other and it should feel incomplete. Can you imagine having a description like that? You're a perfume designer and you have to come up with it. We didn't realize it, but the, the easiest one for them was sex because that was kind of like in a bottle. It was like, and when you smelled it, you were like, oh, okay. It's, it's this unifer, universal thing. So then what we did is we created these pebble shapes that are almost mathematical in their form, and it goes from birth, baby, puberty, sex, partnership, empty nest to death. And when they come together, they uh, still create this pebble form. And, and the logic kind of goes like this, is that the birth and death, when you put them together, it creates the shape. When you put baby and empty nest together, it looks like a pregnant woman. And um, puberty is this full shape, but, uh, bless you, um, but it's divided and in, it's missing a chunk. And sex looks like this form, except that it's a cut, but then comes together beautifully. Um, partnership is a whole, because at that point you refuse together. Empty nest is when you take the baby out, uh, and it's kind of like an empty nest. And then death is um, even emptier. So that's kind of the, um, ta-da. <laughs> So these were um, a very conceptual um, idea, right? But these are the forms that we created, and then the perfumers created um, the scents, and then we presented it at a conference, um, and then we made these balloons full of the puberty smell, and then the whole place ended up smelling like puberty, which was quite, let me tell you, awful. <laughs> so that, that was that. That's... Uh, Let's see, how are we doing here? Okay. Should we leave some time for question and answer? Yes. Okay, then I'm gonna hurry. Yeah. <laughs> um, these are shirts. Shirts. We did a project with a Turkish company um, that manufactures some of the most beautiful short shirts in the world, and they supply to a lot of the uh, companies like H&M, Zara, and more high ends as well. And they asked us to come up with conceptual shirts, and they said, you can do anything you want as long as it's white. So the first thing we did was a black shirt. <laughs> and, uh, and then we said, well, what if we do two shirts back to back? Which they said, okay. And what if we make a shirt that's made up of sleeves. They said, okay. And this is a boo-boo. It's um, inspired by um, African robes. And they did that. And then we said, what if we do a shirt that's only uh, pockets? And they said, yes. So, and our most recent project with them is, um, are these shirts. I'm wearing the February heart shirt. It's, and every month, 
there'll be a shirt. Um, and if you're interested, I can send you the link for it. OK, so these uh, <laughs> fish symbolize um, that we're going into Japan. This is a project that I did in, in Ishinomaki. And Ishinomaki was one of the worst hit cities in the um, 2011 um, tsunami. And I was invited to do um, a project there. Um, they have this um, workshop um, that um, helped people after the tsunami when they lost everything, their homes, their furniture, everything, to rebuild furniture um, out of wood using very simple tools. And by the time I went there, it had already been a year. And they asked me, Aisha, could you donate? We have a lot of things, but we need a small table. Can you donate a, a, the design of a small table that could be made simply out of wood? And I said, OK. Do you need anything else, I asked. And they said, yes. Um, actually, the fabric of the community is really broken. So if you could do something to bring the community back together again. And I thought to myself, I don't know how to do that with a table, you know. But then I thought, what if this is a simple table, but like a Japanese lantern, it has a handle, and that you could take the table by the handle and go to your neighbor and say, do you want to have some sake, or do you want to have some tea together? And maybe that would help bring some people together. And so this is the, I can't, on, at this moment, can't remember his name, but this is the gentleman who started the um, uh, Ishinomaki lab, this idea. And this had become like a destination where people, young people and old people and families would go and work and create things. And so here, this weekend, they created the table I had designed. And you see that in progress. And you see families, like the kids with their um, parents making things. And, um, and this is the end result. So these are the prototypes. And then one of the kids who had been working at the uh, Ishinomaki lab was a 16-year-old high school kid. And he had the idea to, to make the handle go down, as you can see here. And then you could just push it up, and then it would come up. What's ingenious about that, it made the whole thing better, because now you could sit on it as well, like a stool. Um, and that became the, um, the table. And here's the 16-year-old. Um, and here is the, um, one of the sponsors from Herman Miller, who um, helped with a lot of the lab's um, equipment and needs. And so the, these are the, the people who are responsible for, for great things to happen. The idea at the lab is that if you make something, um, you can make this table, or you can make a chair, or you can make anything that is provided using the materials, and then you could take it home. And then you could start to um, furnish your home. And so these are two high school students who made the table, the first tables, and these are um, their teachers who made the, um, the first tables. Demonstration. <laughs> My first customer, happy. <laughs> She's so cute. All right. Um, I'm not going to talk about automobiles, but um, Bibi, my partner and husband, is an automobile designer. So that got us into um, designing automobiles, and um, that's how we met, actually. And so automobiles are probably at the high end of com complexity. And so we do everything from automobiles to pens and pencils and shirts. So there's a big range of, um, of products. And, but more recently, we've also started doing, um, uh, using deconstruction, reconstruction, our um, process to design together with our clients. Before, we used to design things and present to them. Now we work very differently, actually. And we love to work with our clients and say, look, 
here's the process. You deconstruct things, and here's how some tools to help you shift your perspective. Here's how you can reconstruct it, and here's how we can develop ideas together. So we actually do some of our projects, like here, where we will work with non-designers, like um, director of marketing, or research, or uh, you know, human resources, or materials and processes, bring them together, and develop new ideas with them. And so this was uh, for Bridgestone Turkey in Istanbul, where we tried twice um, to come up with different ways of um, creating user experiences. And, and so what you do is you generate, using different tools, like hundreds of ideas, and then you pick up ideas from them. And then for one project, what we did is we literally built a whole space full scale out of cardboard and foam core and printed materials and then invited the executives in. It took us um, two days and the third day we presented to the executives and said, okay, here's the idea, here's the business plan, here's the budget, and here's the experience. -na -na -na. Oh, and here's the app, by the way. So this is a lot of fun and it's actually very efficient because what you do is you work at it with people who are going to influence decisions and make decisions, and you build ownership. So of course, this is not the, the full design, but already within a short amount of time, you have the foundation of the design, and you've already included the people who will become the team for it in the um, ideation phase. All right, where's my knife? Where's my knife? Where's my knife? Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> Here's my knife. Ta-da! Okay, so this is a project for Target, if you want to. And if you go to Target, you'll find the, the uh, sorry, Giada de Laurentiis. You know Giada de Laurentiis? She's amazing. She's a um, chef. She's smart, she's beautiful, I met her, she's um, very personable. Um, what I also like is that she's a, an advocate for making food at home from scratch, but making it simple. So we developed a, a whole collection of kitchen products under her brand for Target, um, and we wanted to represent who she is, that she's beautiful, she's feminine, um, but she's practical. And so how can you create something that feels good in your hand, is practical, uh, inexpensive, but is also beautiful? So these are the first sketches for the, Gia for the Giada collection. And we realized that making something ergonomic that feels good in your hand, like that handle of that knife, can also be a beautiful form because of that twist. It really fits in the um, hollow of your hand. And here is, and then from that we created the visual language that could be applied to many of the products. So this twist handle could be applied to a lot of the cooking pots. That twist handle could apply to a lot of things that you would hold in your hand, the utensils um, and the lids and different um, things could use the circle square form and the holes, things that have holes could use that whole pattern. -na -na -na. Okay, see it has, this collection has about 50 products in it and what I love about it is it's affordable, which you know, that's one thing that's really special when you work with companies like Target and they have mass audiences, right? Um, so you, they can make hundreds, thousands, almost millions of one product, and so they have a lot of um, options and uh, kind of capabilities to make things inexpensively. Um, this potato peeler is like $8, and it's uh, one of the best potato peelers in the market, so I would highly recommend it and then you're holding the knife in your hand. Does that feel like a family? It does feel like a family, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And then when you leave them in the kitchen, they dance. All right. Last but not least. Yes. All right. I want to tell you about design in your life. So when I came up with the, uh, my process, which is deconstruction, reconstruction, and it really is about this inner reflection about how I think and how I've been thinking for all these years and realizing that there's kind of like a, a system, a logic to the craziness, to the internal process. And from that, developing uh, a tangible process that I could teach other people when I first came up with that idea, I showed it to my friends and I was like, look, you can deconstruct and reconstruct ideas and here's how it goes. And they were like, really? I'm like, isn't that simple? And they were like, no, it's not simple. I'm like, really? So it, I worked on it and I worked on it until I was able to simplify it to a level where I could say, okay, it has four steps and here's how it goes. You deconstruct things, you change your perspective on it, you reconstruct and make choices, and then you express it. You express it as a form, you express it through materials, you express it as a strategy, whatever you do. And, um, but I had never used it on a project like as a specific process, right? I had done it intuitively, but I had never really done it as like, here are my four steps and here's how it goes. So, Two things happened. One was GE gave us a project, General Electrics, and what they wanted to do was to see um, if we could apply deconstruction, reconstruction to show the value of design to them, to prove the value of design to them. But the other was I had always believed that my life is my biggest project. And I thought, if life is my biggest project, can I apply deconstruction, reconstruction, my process to it? And will it work? So that seemed like a great experiment. And then one of my friends said, look, Aisha, if you want to do that, I'll offer you a workshop. Put together a workshop, and you can come and do it with my audience. And so I got my um, kind of experiment. And so I put together a workshop. And then Ralph Kaplan is a very dear friend. And I called him up, and I said, Ralph, I'm doing a workshop. It's called um, Designing the Life You Love. And he wrote back this, um, when it, he said, Aisha, he emailed me, when it comes to life, there's no such thing as design, there's only redesign. And that's so true, but still, I still kept it, design the life you love. Um, and, and the whole thing comes from, this is a long story, I'm not going to tell it to you, but um, the, bo the book is going to come out in October, so you can find this in the book. But the idea is, why I think that our life is, a, is our biggest project, and then how the two things um, came together. Yeah, my strategic intent is to design the life I love. So now I do these um, workshops where I teach mostly what I call ordinary people, non-designers, how to design their lives using design process and tools. And you wouldn't believe, it turns out that there are a lot of people who are interested in designing their life. Um, and the, the whole trick is thinking like a designer. Like, you know how to think. Um, but a lot of people don't think like that. One is being optimistic. Because for some reason, as designers, we always think there's a better way to do things and that we can figure it out. Um, two, we're empathic. We can put ourselves in the shoes of other people. Um, we think holistically, 360 degrees. We kind of look at things from a kind of bird's eye view, right? And then we love to ask this question, what if and why not? And then we work collaboratively. We understand that it's much more fun and uh, productive when you include other people's ideas. I hope, right? <laughs> I learned that over time, that collaboration is really a, such a treat. Okay, so then what you do is you deconstruct your life and you make a mind map of everything that goes into your life, and this is just one example. But it's kind of like when you say life, it's such a compact and heavy subject. And like, 
but it's still made up of parts like anything else. So what are those parts and what are the parts of those parts and then what goes into those parts? And what you realize is that big subject life, most often we can think it through, break it into its parts and it fits into a sketchbook page or two. And so that gives you a sense of empowerment that this is something that I can manage. And then I share examples like the Flynet, for example, of like how can people can think about the same things differently and how Nike thought about the shoe differently by simply applying a very old technology like knitting into, uh, in a very new way um, so as, as not to waste any materials. So I give... I show people these examples of um, Flyknit and other like wonderful um, design products and where ideas come from. I also ask them who their heroes are, which I was going to ask you as well, but I don't know if we're going to have time for it. No, we don't have time for it. Okay, you'll have to ask me to come back and we'll do this together, okay? We'll do some exercises. But one of the things is I asked people what, who their heroes are. I gave them my hero, Rowena Reed Costello, who was my teacher. Like Stephen is your amazing teacher. I also had an amazing um, teacher who is 80 something years old when I met her. Um, I give people, I share like John Waters heroes from his book, Role Models. And um, Honey Hong, who's the uh, marketing director of um, Shutterstock, and her hero, her mom, and the story that she told. And Linda Tischler, who also came to one of my workshops, and she's the senior design editor of Fast Company, and her heroes, uh, who are all women, by the way, and um, who all have a um, sense of humor, maybe with the exception of Cleopatra, we don't know. Um, but then I ask people, who are your heroes? So, and this is homework. Um, go home or sit at a cafe and write, you say, my heroes, and then try to make a list of your heroes, people who come to your mind, and write their name, and also maybe do a little icon or drawing for them, and then write the qualities that you love about them. You know, what's it, why are they your heroes? And heroes, quote unquote, right? It's just people that you like or you admire that have influenced you in one way or another. And then um, we'll talk about it. And if you do it, and if you're curious, um, have Stephen um, email me, or one of you email me, and I'll tell you the rest of the story. Okay? It leads to something. Um, another tool that we use is um, metaphors. Um, so metaphors, I don't know if you know, you use metaphors in your design process, but it's very powerful if you can say, my design is like a beehive, and kind of explain what it is that makes it like a beehive. Um, here it's uh, people, when it, they're thinking about their life, they come up with life metaphors, and from that we generate new ideas and think about life differently. And then we reconstruct it, which reconstructing in design or in life is making choices. So I ask them to define their life in three things, which is really hard to do, but it gets you to make choices and you realize these are the three things that matter, and then what you need to leave out to make room for things that really matter. Okay, and, uh, and then people express their, um, the life they love in different ways, in stories, in poems, uh, in to-do lists. So this was funny because um, one of, at one of the workshops, I had a woman executive who wrote a beautiful poem, Growth is Now, and then her colleague who came to my Another one of my workshops gave her a needle point of her poem. And this is the needle point of that growth is now. Okay. But this is kind of what um, the workshops look like. Uh, deconstructing life. This is, is a deconstruction of life. I did this at Bois Boucher. I don't know if you know Bois Boucher. It's a Oh, I would really recommend it. Bois Boucher is a, design, a summer design school that Vitra 
uh, organizers, and it's written like this if you um, Google it. Wa Bushi. And they're usually one week long or two week long projects in many, many different um, subjects, including, I mean, if you can do a workshop on design in your life, I think you can do almost anything. But So this is what a deconstruction looks like. Um, these are what heroes pages look like. See, just like I told you, Khalil Fong, Michael Jackson, icons, and why. You can even um, scan and send me your pages. I'll be happy to look at it. And these are their metaphors. Isn't that funny? With drawings. And then these are their expressions. Um, each one of these is a life uh, representative. And the uh, constraint here was that everybody's solution had to fit in a cubic space. Because that's why they're all kind of cubic or close to it. And then I also teach um, designing your life at your sister school, POD, Products of Design at SVA. And so this is one of my favorite, favorite um, class projects where one of my students did a, dis a system for life that's made based on colors. And every color has a specific meaning. And when you combine them, it creates, it defines something about life. And this one, it's hard to see, but it's her way of saying, I love you. Is that beautiful? It really is beautiful. I'm I'm in love with it. <laughs> okay, I think. Oh, okay. Last but not least. So what happened is through this um, deconstruction, reconstruction, I'm a product designer, but then I started applying uh, my process to my life and started teaching other people how to design their life and realized that it actually is a very useful process. My whole notion of what I do and product design changed. And I realized that actually as designers, uh, we're not designing products or we're not designing systems or interfaces. What we're trying to do is we're trying to design people's lives. Um, and that I am actually a, a designer of life. Uh, and I try to do that through the products. Um, and the, the best person, actually, that I know who's a designer of life, I know, I know of, is Steve Jobs. And I realized this when um, Steve Jobs died, and uh, we all learned about it. And um, that night, I was putting my kids to bed, and um, Awa, who's my um, eldest, was, I think, at the, at the time, like six or seven. And she was lying in bed, and she had heard us talk about something happened, somebody died. And we were so sad about um, this event. And she said, Mom, who died? Um, and I said, Steve Jobs. And he's like, she's like, who's Steve Jobs? And I said, well, you know, you know, we all have these computers, you know, Apple computers, and we have our iPhones. And, um, iPods, and he was the uh, person who created all those. He died. And then suddenly, she was lying in bed. She shot up from bed like this, and she said, but mom, how are we going to live now? <laughs> and I realized that, that and I, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but that's the meaning of being a successful designer, is that your loss is really a loss. So anyway, that's the, um, the, the, you know, the uh, how are we going to live now and what it is to, um, to design a life. And, ah, okay. One last piece, a little, all of this captured in a little um, graphic. The idea is design and creativity is one of 
divergence and convergence. And you kind of start here with the person, the designer, and you try to reach this other person, the user, at the end of the bubble. And so you start, and you start with observation and understanding what we know and trying to break it apart. And then in the middle, you generate lots of ideas, and that's where your point of view is shifting from what you know today towards what could happen in the future. And then you start to converge on making choices and some ideas that matter in reconstruction, as I call it, the decision making. And then you express it, and there comes um, an action, and you end up with, um, with a result. And so you go from today to tomorrow, but when you're creating, there's the suspension of time that, that's really lovely. All of this is sustained by your values, and here there's a lot of inspiration, and here as you start to choose your ideas, there's a lot of logic, and because you need to make sense of things. And again, Somewhere here, you're starting to think differently, and you forget what you know, and you start imagining. And here, someplace, you start to make choices. choices. And this also is held with constraints, which are also your opportunities. And as you come out of the tunnel, you resolve your constraints and opportunities to um, to come up with the, the, what you think is the right answer. And in the beginning, you're bound by, by what you know. In the middle, you're freed by your imagination. And at the end, you're energized by what's possible. And really, what you try and do is this excitement that you feel in the beginning when you have a great idea. You know, you're by yourself or you're with your team and you feel like you're onto something. That excitement you try to carry that excitement all the way to the user so that they are as excited and in love with your idea as you were in the very beginning. To me, that's kind of the, the process of design. Thank you. <laughs> You're such, such a lovely audience. Thank you so much because you didn't fall asleep. You were as sharp in the beginning as you are now, so thank you for that. It, it's very hard to do in a, in a dark room with a projector, so. <laughs> Any, um, okay, now we have a little bit of time. How about some questions? I struggle from balancing my life, doing what I like and what I have to do. Yeah. So how do you manage it? You, um, I don't know. <laughs> it's always a struggle. Because you told, told us that uh, you work during the vacation, mm -hmm. and uh, how do you arrange the schedule? Because sometimes we schedule it just for a week for, uh, to go out for a vacation, but uh -huh. if you uh, have some inspiration during that uh -huh. period, and you will spend more time on that. Yeah. Um, very good question, and it's case by case, but for example, I showed you Bois Boucher, where I went and taught, right? I mean, that was work. I had to teach full days for five days, but it was also a vacation for me because it was outside in nature with students and really some incredibly smart and creative people. So sometimes it's how you look at things. So you could imagine school as... Um, that's my vacation. That's your vacation. <laughs> that, and maybe it's not always a vacation, but imagine you're with your friends in a creative environment yeah, in the best true. place in the world, in New York. Sometimes it is like vacation, yeah, right? So, and maybe you think about that, and even if you think about it every now and then, and shift your position. Like, to me, coming here today, 
I don't know if it's vacation, but it made me happy. I'm like, I love it. I'm going to meet some new, smart, young people and um, tell you about what I do. That's much better than sitting at a meeting, right? Yeah. I'm lucky. So, and then I'll go home and I'll cook for my kids and that's it. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I wonder about that. <laughs> like, just not on purpose and just kind of slip out, or is there a conscious I consciously think about it, but it's really hard to consciously do it. And also, you try to do things, but it doesn't mean that the kids will enjoy it. So, um, you know, especially because it's coming from their parents. Sometimes it backfires. So one thing I realized, though, is I'm hoping that it, some kind of osmosis will happen. So one thing about us is um, a couple of years ago, we decided to leave our office and work from our home, which is a loft, so we can do that. Um, and one of the incredible benefits of that is when our children come home, we're home, our team is with us, and they see us in action. Before that, we would kind of go in the morning and come at night, and there was no connection between our home life or life and work. So they see us at work. They see us talking about budgets. They see us designing things and working, designing things on easels, doing brainstorming and whatnot. And so one of the things that I find is, um, so now when we, it's very simple, but when we want to think about something with the children, like we need to make a plan or kind of organize something, we take the easel out and we draw on it together with them. It's almost like a design project. And it's things like that that they hopefully, um, they might, who knows if they'll ever do design, but some of that thinking and um, how you organize your thinking or create bubbles and, um, some of that will rub off. So we'll see. You had a question, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, so when you design, do you do a lot by hand, like scribbling, or does do you more on the screen? So <clears throat> I do almost everything through sketching. It's my thinking. Um, a writer writes and. Us designers, we draw most of the time, schematic or whatever it is. It's, even today, we're working on a project with Nissan about uh, mobility, and we need to explain something, and it was all like drawing it out and storyboarding the idea. And when, well, as soon as you do that, things change. You know, it's like by doing it, you're actually creating. So I spend very little time on the screen, uh, but I'm lucky enough to work with people who could then take it and translate it into a screen. One thing that I do miss that we don't do anymore is we used to make everything by hand, full scale, and we had the, uh, the shop, the, the means to do it, and that also is very powerful. Uh, in, I had a teacher, Bruce Hanna at Pratt, who used to say, you have to mock it up before you fuck it up. So that really like, is the best advice. But now I don't really have time to go in and make stuff. And I, I know that my designs lose something because you don't have that tacti tactile kind of shaping. But, um, a lot of the very talented people that we work with, they, they bring that in. So it's, I've become more of a conceptual thinker. Any other questions? Yeah. What's your favorite thing that you uh, learn or that you get from working on your rotation and like, meeting people better? What's the one thing that I've learned? My favorite thing about that is um, 
you know what I miss is these times when there were no email, no like internet. There's some lovely things about the internet, but the disruption is very destructive. And so what I love on vacation is people know I'm on vacation, and so I can concentrate on one thing at a time, and I'm not interrupted. And the worst kind of interruption is like from my kids saying, like, are you coming in the water with us? Like, swimming. And that's very welcome, but that, that, I think that's what the vacation affords you, is that um, you're not there, so people don't bug you, and so now you can think about things, really. So what, to be able to do that in my daily life, my new trick, and I can only do this now at a certain age, is getting up early in the morning. And so that's, I have like a pocket of time where nobody knows I'm awake except me and I can think um, until all the emails start. And because even if I tell myself, okay, I'm not going to answer my emails until like noontime, I can't help it. I'm, I go and look at it and then the magic is gone. So, but early in the morning works well. For some people, very late at night also works well. But I get sleepy, so <laughs> I, I can't do that anymore. Right. This is like the not so creative stuff, I think. Is right. that some, sometimes wrong or not? It's not always so optimistic, but thank you for saying that. It's, there are some times where it's really, uh, it's really hard. And I, I say often, I think designing and creating is one of the hardest things you can do. But it's also one of the most exciting and liberating things you could do because you imagine things that other people can't imagine or don't imagine. I mean, what could be better than that? But then you get punished for it. You know? <laughs> it's like you get slapped for it. So that happens. But it, um, one thing that we try to do is we tr really try to work with good people. Um, both on the client's side and on our side. And that makes a huge difference. So that you hang out with people that you really enjoy hanging out with, even though it's a, it's a work relationship. Um, that makes a huge difference. Can you always control it? No. Um, but the people we work long term with are usually the pe people who like us and we like them. And there's some shared values. We trust each other. And so that, that makes it uh, really worthwhile. Yeah. I feel uh, most of your work is really based on the user experience. Yes. And uh, how, what's your opinion on something that's beautiful but useless? That also has use. Creating beauty is very hard. Uh, uh, for example, uh, there's a table using really beautiful decoration. Mm -hmm. But when you're sitting in front of it, it you feel really uncomfortable because maybe it's too sharp or too right. high. Yeah. So what do you think of this kind of design? I think everything is meaningful within its context, right? If there's a context for that, maybe that is the right design, but it's not for everybody. So. It, um, but my kind of thinking, the projects that I like is when I can really think about the user and then maybe solve a problem or two for them. And, um, but beauty, beauty is interesting because it's so hard to create. So sometimes the best projects are when you can harmonize everything, like make it beautiful physically and intellectually really intelligent and spiritually inspiring and um, there's one more and emotionally satisfying 
But that's so hard to do, you know. It, so often um, we get maybe one piece of it. Sometimes we get two, sometimes three, sometimes four. So those, those four quadrants guide me. And I'll tell you again, it's the intellect, spirit, <laughs> emotion, and physical. And actually, if we do um, a Design the Life You Love uh, session together, you'll see that we deconstruct along those four quadrants, and then we reconstruct along those four quadrants. And it's a good way to remember, to ask yourself, what's the emotion of this? What's the intellect of this? What's the spirit of this? So that you kind of go around it fully. That's very hard. <laughs> very hard, yeah. That's what's interesting. <laughs> Any other questions? Ron, were you able to have me on camera? Yes. Most of the time? <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed it. This was my vacation, you know? <laughs> thank you. Oh, I should also note my um, email.